site and she sent me a one of your lectures and I started listening to it and I said, I know this guy, where do I know him from? And then I said, oh, well, he's somewhere in Malaysia. And I said, oh, gosh, well, all these memories are a bit ancient for me right now. And uh, they're not really clear. But I do, I did remember your face. And I certainly remembered um, Brother Yusuf introducing us. But I don't remember much about anything that we did together. I'm sure we had a few conversations and whatnot. And uh, you... I, I was with ISTAC, you were with um, IIUM, and I, our paths didn't cross that frequently, as I remember, but we, we, did, uh, we did meet. <clears throat> and um, these were formative years, I think, for both of us as converts, if I'm not mistaken. We've traveled uh, a, a similar path. Um, Amina, are you still with us? Um, my wife, okay. I don't know if we're being recorded yet, yet or not. Me... Oh, it says it says here that we are. This is being recorded. Okay, we are being recorded. Okay, well then that's very good. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, we these were formative years for us. So we followed um, a, a similar developmental path in our lives, as somebody once called me um, a convert whose feet are in and out of Islam, which is not a, necessarily a bad thing. So when, and that was in reference to tradition, you see. And um, this is why I'm interested in getting back in touch with you uh, as uh, led by Allah now through one of my students, a sister Salma, I think her name was. In any case, um, this is uh, some I don't know her, but um, we we she often links and uh, clicks and gives me a hands up or whatever on uh, linked when I post something that she likes and admires. In any case, um, we're both dealing with um, the revision that's going on in Islam, uh, Brother Karim. And um, it's still a phenomenon which is not, I'm not intimately involved, although I seem to be somehow at the vanguard of this thing in the minds of some people who have marginalized me because of it, you see. And um, this is an interesting phenomenon because as you say in the one lecture I did listen to, to early, almost half listened to, Islam has been, or the revelation of Islam, if you want to put it that way, uh, has been eclipsed by this tradition, you see. And this is news, not to me, not to you, but to many traditionalists, you see. And it's not easy to accept. And uh, if I may, um, just go on a little bit before I hand the floor over to you, dear brother, by way of introduction. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. May it please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us his direction and clarity of thought for the sake of ourselves, our own erudition, our own education, and the education of our listeners. Um, this eclipse uh, if I can liken it um, to my own experience as a Catholic, I was brought up Catholic. You know, we were not taught the Bible. We were taught the catechism. And the catechism, as I came to appreciate it over the years, was a, a, a misrepresentation of actually what was in the Bible. And it it seemed to... Um, characterize a politically correct position. So it was a form of uh, mind control, which I rejected early on, but I could not extricate myself from that position uh, until I actually left and went off to college. 
at the age of 18 or 19 or so because I'm surrounded by Catholics, you see, every which way I turn. My parents, my brothers and sisters, uh, nine siblings there alone, my father's uh, 14 siblings, and all those people who characterized and I lived amongst, they were all Catholic and they all listened to the priest and they all went to Holy Communion when they thought they could afford to do so without any spiritual, serious spiritual repercussions and all this sort of thing. And I rejected all of these things, although as a child, people thought I was going to be a priest because I sang with this heavenly voice and um, I had, um, I don't know, I must have had some sort of light about me and everybody just thought I was going, I was such a holy child, you know, but, you know, when I knelt at the altar, even under the auspices of this catechism, I was very sincere in my faith. I would kneel before the statues and light the candles and burn the incense like everyone else. And, um, I was very sincere with this, but, um, the rejection of this tradition caused me to be rejected by that culture. And later, you see, I'm going to advance this tale by 50 years or 40 years or so in Malaysia as a non-traditional Muslim convert, you see, I also came to reject this tradition. I said, something's wrong here. And I couldn't put my finger on it because I'm new to Islam. Uh, I'm not new to the study of comparative religion. However, I never studied Islam. And the first time I picked up the Quran, three days later, after completing my reading of it, I was a Muslim, you see. And this was in the jungle of Borneo. I confessed my Shahada, whatever you want to call it, in the middle of the jungle to the animals and to the uh, angels and whatever other unseen creatures were in my little jungle house there up on the mountains. Um, so when I came to this position, I said, something's wrong here with the traditional posture. I was reminded of my own rejection by my Catholic culture. You see, I have brothers and sisters who were confirmed Catholics, and they're all convinced that I'm going to hell, you see. And then I found the same reaction, you see, from um, Muslims and non-Muslims, you see, when I converted to Islam, because so soon after I converted to Islam, I said, well, you know, this doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. Why are you doing that? I'm asking all these questions and no one can give me a clear answer. I'm looking for definition. I'm looking for clarity. I'm looking for what, uh, um, what's this, uh, P Professor Alataz called Adab, you see. And um, I couldn't find it. I could not find this clear definition. Everyone was referring to the Hadith. Everyone was referring to the tradition. And because of the reference to the tradition rather than to the Quran, I found myself being rejected or questioned. I say, how dare you question that? Well, that was the same thing when I got, when I said to the priest or the, to the nun, how can God be a man? You see, how is this possible? And there's no, there's no answer to that. You see, they don't have an answer. You just have to believe, you see. So when I saw this, and then I saw my wife's rejection of me, her family's rejection of me, because they were, they were uh, Christians. When I converted in the jungle, they were, they, they were Christians. And I was actually teaching in the Christian church there. I was a, considered a, a teacher and someone to be respected. I was given the podium on Sundays, this sort of thing. And um, they all rejected me because I had, uh, and they, they actually wanted me to leave my, my house and my home and my family, you see, because I'd become a Muslim. And they had no definition. They did not want to discuss anything, you see. I said, I can tell you why I converted. And my wife's brother, who was the man of the family at that time, said, we don't want to hear it. We don't want to talk about this. We just want you gone, you see. And I'm getting... Mm, the equivalent 
in the Muslim Ummah, uh, they, they don't want me gone. They just want me to be like them, you see. And uh, so, well, this is irrational, okay, because uh, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to mm, percolate all these imaginations that run through our minds when you read the scripture, when you read the history, when you look at the symbols, when you look at the analogies that are made within the scripture, when you look at the metaphors, when you compare them to what came before, which is what Quran said, it came to complete. You see, the Quran in itself is not complete, not in itself. But if you consider the Quran part of what came before, then it is a completion. You see, and I always said this and I always got marginalized because of it. And I said, well, my God, these people do not want to study the arcana. They do not want to look at the, seriously look at the locution that is used and was used and is currently used by those who are studying these things in depth. Okay. No, they just want to turn to the Hadith. So the Hadith has become its own religion, and you must believe in it, you see. Now, let me take this a step further, dear brother. Um, I heard um, Yusuf, um, uh, one of the, I've forgotten his name now. His full name. Anyway, one of these uh, modern preachers, um, it, it'll come to me in a minute. Yusuf Estes, maybe. You, no, not, not, not Yusuf Estes. Is not, well, I must be using the wrong name. I'm not good with names, and I, I don't remember them all very well. But uh, I remember concepts. I remember principles. I remember moral precepts. I remember ethical positions, this sort of thing. And I, I remember the, the lessons of history. Names I, I get um, confused with. Anyway, one of these uh, modern preachers who's very well thought of, he stands on the uh, that podiums and she hold, holds hands with, uh, you know, the Buddhist monks and the Catholic priests, yeah. and they want this perennialist position, you see. He, he, he once said a few years ago, he said, well, a large majority, the majority of the Hadith are fabricated. He said that Hamza, Hamza, Hamza that Yusuf. Hamza? Yeah, Hamza Yusuf said this. Thank you very much. Hamza Yusuf said this. He, he made a bit public statement. A large majority, the majority, a large majority of these 500,000 hadith are fabricated. Well, then, sir, as the authority, which ones are true? Will you please tell us? And they don't do this. They give us these, you know, 30 levels of classification, but we don't get to know which ones are completely and totally reliable. Well, you and I as academics and... Um, you know, students of thought, if you will, we, we, we can make our own determinations if we want to take the time to try and study 500,000 hadith, which is in, an impossibility uh, to begin with, which automatically causes one who thinks to reject, you see, this position. Not reject the hadith, but reject that they are revealed knowledge, you see. You see, it can't possibly be. Anyway, um, if you take that position uh, and then think about, okay, well, please, sir, as the authority, tell us which ones are reliable. Tell us which ones. Give us a book that we can rely on then. They don't do that, you see. Well, why? Why is that? Well, they've established a catechism, you see. <laughs> if I can go back to my my little boy at the idol position, studying the catechism and lighting candles to an idol and asking the idol to give me help, you see. Now that's idolatry, as far as I'm concerned. That's, well, blind faith, okay? And if you wanna teach your children that, okay, that's your prerogative, but I'm not gonna teach that to my children. I'm not going to teach that position to anyone under my right hand. I'm just not going to do it, sir. Okay, you're, you're free to do that. There's no 
compulsion in religion. There's no force in religion. So don't force me to take your position, and I won't force you to take mine. So let's just go our way in peace. The problem is that proselytizers for either position with your Catholic or Muslim traditions, they can't leave you in peace, you see. I can leave them in peace, but they won't leave me in peace. So that forces me to break off relationship with them, you see. It's something I don't want to do, but I have to do it because they won't let me alone. It's like the, you know, it's like the, uh, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist or the Mormon who knocks on your door. You see, and they say they want to have a cup of coffee with you, but they won't leave for three hours unless you kick them out. You see, and it, they 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 won't leave because they want you to become like them. Okay, well, this is the same position. This is a cultural position. This is a culture. It is not a position of truth. It's a position of a culture. It's a position of belief. It's like, it's the same thing. I, I might as well just be talking to my wife's brother who told me he doesn't want to discuss my rational thinking or the reasons that I converted. He just wants me gone, okay? He wants me to either return to his fold or he wants me gone, okay? Well, I can respect him rather than the person who was do, doesn't want to leave me alone. And the traditional do not want to leave people like me alone. They will then prosecute us. They will then backbite. They will then go online and tell all sorts of things that are uninformed, you see, about you. And this is, well, how shall we say? It's impolite. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a correct moral or ethical thing to do. And yet they claim to be Allah's servants. Now, brother, we have a serious problem in the Ummah, and there are students who are looking for relevance. And I'm sure you understand that position. You're still in Malaysia, I understand. And I'm sure the students are still coming to you as they used to come to my door when I was still teaching there. And they would knock on the door and it would kind of be almost be a furtive knock. You know, they want to look down the hallway and see if anybody's looking at them, come to talk to Dr. Omar, you see, because they're looking for relevance. I had students who came and sat down with me and said, look, um, I have to confess this to you. I don't know who else to talk to about it. You know, I, I'm... I was a member of, I went to the madrasa all these years, and I was molested by the teachers there, not just one, you see. And my sister has been molested by her uncles, you see. And why, how is this Islam, doctor, please, how is this Islam that I must go to Juma with, with them on Friday afternoons and pray behind them? How, how please. Now, as I begin to talk about this, brother, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to stop myself from weeping because this is a very serious position. It's a very serious malady. It's sickness. This is a spiritual soul sickness that is rampant throughout the Ummah all over the world, all over the world, not just in Malaysia. And the traditionalists do not want to talk about this. It's like the Catholic priests, they don't want to talk about the child molestation that's taking place in their domiciles, in, in their institutions, and throughout history. They don't want to talk about the babies who were buried between the seminary and the convent that were found in the tunnel during the wars, when the bombs opened them up. They don't want to talk about these things. Now, we're not obligated to expose the sins of our brothers and sisters, but we are obligated to speak the truth. And the speaking the truth reveals that sin. And if sin separates you from revelation, it separates you from communication, it separates you from salat, it separates you from the samawat, it separates you from God, then why would you want to avoid it? Why would you not want to be free from this lie? 
like those students who came and knocked on my door and say, why, Dr. Omar, why? And why do they come to talk to me? I'm the one who's marginalized. You see. Now, dear brother, having given that as, a, as an introduction, I think you can now understand why it is that Allah has allowed us to reconvene our relationship and communicate and collaborate for the sake of our students. They're desperately looking for relevance. So tell us, dear brother, how is it that Islam, the truth of revelation, the Al-Quran has been eclipsed by this catechism called tradition? Yeah, thank you, Brother Omar, for a very fascinating introduction. Actually, it was so in interesting. I thought almost I should stay quiet for the rest of the talk and <laughs> let you speak because it also occurred to me, Brother, that you should definitely write your autobiography if you haven't done so already because your story is just really fascinating uh, and uh, share your, your experience with the wider world. Mine is already up there on Amazon, but I think definitely <laughs> yours is very, very fascinating. So I would definitely say that you should consider that seriously. By the way, I look on the relationship between the Quran and the previous scriptures as well, uh, the way I'd like to put it is that the Quran confirms what came before. Uh, yes. What is between your hands? There are 10 verses that use that expression mm -hmm. and 10 more, ten more mm -hmm. verses that the Torah and the Angel together in the same, mm -hmm. same verse. And in fact, I remember I first began to think about this relationship between uh, the Quran and the previous revelations because as I was teaching, by the way, it was the uh, University of Science Islam Malaysia, the Islamic Science University of Malaysia where I was mm -hmm. teaching. Uh, my students would tell me uh, that uh, because from time to time I would touch on issues relating to Islam, although I was supposed to teach English, but f the first five or ten minutes or uh, five minutes or so I would discuss, touch on some issues relating to Islam. So in the course of those uh, little introductions, I must have mentioned something that, uh, you know, uh, the students came back to me and said, but Mr. Abdul Karim, don't you know that the, the Quran abrogated the previous, uh, you know, revelations? And I said, no, I don't know that. I mean, yes, and I yes, told, yes. told them that, on the contrary, uh, the Quran uh, confirmed the previous revelations. Now, I emphasize the word revelation rather than a scripture because the written scriptures have obviously been tampered with. Of so course. That, yeah. And here, here the Quran made also some corrections to the misconceptions that have arisen in relation to the uh, or, or around the previous scriptures. Mm -hmm. For example, well, you know, the Quran rejects the doctrine of Trinity, the doctrine of vicarious atonement, uh, that uh, yeah. Allah has a son, uh, or that uh, mm -hmm. Jesus is Allah, and, that, and monasticism, or what, what have you, maybe half a dozen points yeah, that, uh, that is, are rejected. And in fact, I had a friend from the U.S., uh, he was from, I think, uh, I don't know whether I should identify the location or not, Cana in Connecticut, I even visited him. He was doing a PhD and MA in religious studies at the University of Toronto's uh, Religious Studies Department and we talk, we talk from time to time and he mentioned to me that uh, in his department they had more than 600 different versions of the New Testament and his oh job was to, I know and his job was to identify the one correct uh, version <laughs> by calling <laughs> yeah. you know I said my god <laughs> that is a mammoth task yes, you know right. and of course he, he, he couldn't do that um, so after finishing no. the, He's a May and halfway through his PhD, he just threw in a towel and said, I've had enough of this. Yeah. I don't want to re 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 repeat, repeat his words, but he started with the letters B, S, yes. and he, he left. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. So, so uh, that's about the, the, the relationship of the, but that, that's what kind of started me thinking about this. And I realized that, uh, that my students were getting this misinformation from their yes. teachers, from the tradition. Mm -hmm. People like Ibn Kathir yeah. brazen, yeah. brazenly appeared contrary to the Quran that the Quran abrogated the, the, the previous uh, revelation, which is absolute nonsense. Even yeah. uh, Muhammad Asad confirms in his uh, footnote on verse 106 in Surah Al Baqarah and his translation of the Quran that there's no such thing as abrogation uh, in Islam. And in mm -hmm. fact, he adds that there's not a single hadith in the entire corpus of uh, you know, the traditions that confirms the doctrine of abrogation. 
Mm -hmm. So it's a concept that we have to reject. And in fact, uh, most contemporary scholars do reject it. I don't know if I can drop a few names. Uh, from the old mm -hmm. days, there was Abu Muslim Ali Bani who rejected the doctrine of abrogation on the basis of the three verses in Al Quran where Allah Ta'ala says that we will never find a change in his words. Kalimallah, mm -hmm. they do not change. So. Yeah. That's one thing. Then among the contemporary ulama, we have people like uh, Muhammad Abdu, Rashid Rida, Ismail mm -hmm. Farooqi, uh, Muhammad Assad, Mu uh, Muhammad Ghazali, uh, Fazlur Rahman, uh, who, who else? Taha Jabir Rawani. Uh, all of these people uh, reject the doctrine of abrogation. This is one of the biggest problems, I think, in the scholarly mm -hmm. understanding of Islam. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the, the ulama claim, for example, that uh, the verse uh, number five in Surah number nine, the so-called uh, sword verse, where which says, kill them wherever you find them, which is uh, taken out of context, not only by non-Muslims, but even worse by Muslims themselves. The mm -hmm. ulama that this one verse abrogated uh, 120 piece verses of the Quran. This is another astonishing assertion. So mm -hmm. this this allegation, the, the recourse to the doctrine of abrogation actually facilitated what I call another very major development or very major corruption of our knowledge of uh, Islam, which is that it basically transformed Islam as a religion of peace into Islam as a religion of war, you see. Because mm -hmm. some of the ulama later on, including some leading names, names uh, have alleged that the based on the doctrine of abrogation they re-articulated the teaching of uh, jihad the military part of it uh, al quran allows uh, uh, military jihad only in self defense and fighting yes. against oppression but the ulama have transformed this and postulated a doctrine of uh, aggressive or offensive jihad, which mm -hmm. is called jihad al talab in jurisprudence. And this, uh, they made this into a sixth pillar of Islam and mm -hmm. said that basically Muslims are required to go to war against non-Muslims at least once a year, even when the non-Muslims are not attacking the Muslims. Now, to me, this is an astonishing corruption of, uh, of the teaching of the Quran. And by the way, mm -hmm. you Yusuf al Kardavi in a publication of 2009 called uh, Fiqh of Jihad. You can find some interesting book reviews uh, online of this mm -hmm. book. He basically mm -hmm. uh, backpedals on this doctrine of uh, aggressive jihad and basically says that, well, no, uh, Islam doesn't really teach that. But he's very mm -hmm. soft on the traditional ulama. Mm -hmm. uh, the militant ulama, basically, we could call them that they are, you know, very aggressive, you know, here. Uh, they, and they include people like Said Qutub, uh, Maududi, and Ibn Taymiyyah, you see, who all concluded uh, on the basis of those, uh, the, the doctrine of abrogation, and also on the basis of the verse that, uh, you know, uh, Allah calls the Muslims the Ummat and Khairan, the best community, because they command what is good and prohibit what is wrong. Amr bil ma'ruf ma nahyan al munkar. So their uh, conclusions uh, uh, actually constitute a non sequitur. They do not follow from those verses, as a number of people show. One name I can mention, his name is Niaz A. Shah, that's S-H-A-H, in a paper published by Oxford University Press and also republished by the European Journal of Islamic Law. Uh, the name of the paper is uh, Use of Force in Islamic Law. He uh, analyzes the, these developments, the Jihad al Talab, and shows basically that it is uh, that, that was an aberration in Islamic jury, uh, exegesis and jurisprudence. And uh, uh, there's another publication published by the Quilliam Foundation. Uh, Adam Dean and uh, Majid Nawaz are the co-editors. Uh, the the, the paper is called, the book is called uh, uh, Responding to Takfiri uh, Theology, and it can be found online in PDF format. And the authors are Saleh Ansari and uh, Usama Hassan. They also tackle this issue of the aggressive jihad and show how uh, the, the some of the uh, traditional ulama, by, and by the way, this was a majority opinion. This mm -hmm. was not a minority opinion. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm quite shocked how the ulama, the traditional ulama that are presented to us as these, uh, you know, gentlemanly, you know, fatherly figures who had always our best interest in mind and who were so knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. They spent entire mm -hmm. lifetimes studying this that we, we do not question what they are telling us. Mm -hmm. Even mm -hmm. when it goes exactly contrary to the teaching of the Quran. So 
so much about the doctrine of abrogation. I have a book, by the way, on that. Uh, it's on, mm -hmm. also on Amazon. It's called "Does the Final Testament Abrogate the New and uh, Old Testament?" The answer, the short answer, is no. I also have a couple of videos on it. One on my own YouTube channel, and another one I did with James Eastide, and I. And I have six uh, detailed videos on it, about 15 is each, on academia. However, these videos are only uh, available to premium subscribers. So sure. this whole, yeah, this yeah, whole I have a section my, like that also on my website. If I could interject here for just a minute, ahead, I, want ahead, take this, I want to take this idea of aggressive jihad a step further with yeah. respect to the traditional position, because this is, this is probably uh, a fundamental principle that has been incorporated in their belief system, in their mindset, that uh, permits them to think they can be aggressive towards someone who d disagrees with them. You see, and uh, so this is—they they think that um, they think that this is a correct position, and that they are defending Islam. Uh, when in fact they're they are standing on the lie to begin with, so this is a very dangerous um, position, and I think I, I wanted to bring that out for the students who can comprehend the the, the problem, uh, the, the 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 concept here is that uh, this is one of the reasons uh, you cannot find the relevance that you're seeking because these people will not permit it. It's kind of like, you remember, uh, you're, you're a student of philosophy, uh, Brother Karin. So you remember there's a famous statue, or I think it's a painting of um, Aristotle placing yeah. his hand on the head of Plato, you see. Oh, really? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that this is a form, this is a message. The whole uh, imagery there is one of repression. Uh, let's not listen to Plato. Let's now listen to me, you see. Let's not listen to the man who taught me. Listen only to me, you see, because I really understand. You see, so this is um, this is a, 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 a this is the traditional position. They 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 want to defend their position, and they're working in error. You see, now, I'm not saying that Aristotle was wrong. That everything, of course, he wasn't. I mean, he had some really good positions, and of course. Uh, Alexander the Great uh, wanted to put him to death for some of his positions, which were actually correct. But to repress reason, individual reason, all right, but which uh, we're pro approaching the concept of each jihad now, you see. Oh, I'm not permitted to think, you see. You're, you're not permitted to think? No, 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 no. This is, this is contrary to God's signs. How many of these signs are you going to reject? I gave you reason. How are you going to reject this? Well, that's what they're doing. They're rejecting your ability to reason, and they just want you to open the catechism and bow yeah. before their statue. You see, there. This is a form of idolatry. So I just and they're being aggressive about it. You see, I'm not aggressive. I I just speak the truth and. If you don't want to accept it, that's fine. Just turn me off or I'll just go home. It doesn't matter. I, I'll leave you in peace. But they don't want to leave you in peace. So I'm getting at the, I'm trying to use you, dear brother, to get at this root of uh, aggression, aggressiveness, you see. Because this is not in defense of Islam. This is in defense of a lie. Yes. If, we, if we want to perform adab, and we want to use our reason to define the position, that's what it appears to be. Absolutely. Oh. Yes. Uh, very well said, uh, uh, Brother uh, Omar. Um, actually, yeah, now, um, uh, where, uh, where do I go from here? Yeah, about the word eclipse, uh, I yes. was surprised you brought that up because that's how my whole journey started with that single yes, word. Yes. Uh, and the way, that, way that, the way it happened was that uh, after I finished uh, working with Professor Dr. Muhammad Hashim Kamali, with whom I stayed for almost 10 years, I left at the end of 2017 and I was trying to finish a paper, I believe it was a paper on abrogation, in fact. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were on a vacation in Koh Samui, Thailand, where we, it was a working uh, vacation, vacation for me. And I was, I would spend a few hours, uh, you know, in a local Starbucks, uh, writing the stuff down and what have you. But I was struggling with this one, one question. Uh, I knew that, um, you know, something 
uh, went seriously wrong in Muslim intellectual and political history, but I couldn't put my finger on it, you see. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know uh, that fellow uh, Bernard Lewis who wrote an article, it could be even be a book, What Went Wrong? Now, here's some, some points that are worthy of consideration, but I think the problem goes much deeper than what he touched on. So mm-hmm. I'm thinking about this, and I, I could feel this, uh, that I'm like, you know, uh, trying to find it, is it here, is it this, is it that. So on, after about three days or so, uh, I think it was three or four days, this word, one word popped into my brain. I think Allah finally had pity on me and popped this <laughs> word in my brain. And that word was eclipse, you know. I say, oh my God, suddenly yeah. every everything became clear almost like when you you know you are you know the sky is all like the, the uh, there's fog right you cannot see anything and suddenly the fog is blown away now you see the landscape and you see every yeah. so I immediately realized my god this is what happened there was yeah. an eclipse mm-hmm. now what kind of eclipse was it it was the eclipse of the quran of the uh, light of revelation by the light or the, by the moon by the hadiths you see Mm-hmm. The tradition got between us and the revelation, and it didn't eliminate all the light. It just reduced the amount of light that we yes. are getting. Mm-hmm. So now, as you know, the moon does is not a source of light itself. It just reflects light very of poorly. Course, yeah. mm-hmm. If you have a choice walking by moonlight at night or in the daylight, of course you will choose to work, uh, walk in the daylight. And this is what happened in the Muslim world. So many Muslims are walk, uh, walking uh, by moonlight, by the light of the Hadith, the little light that it might be reflecting from the Quran. And, and the, 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 they are not really accessing, uh, uh, utilizing the Quran. Uh, it, we have a verse in our Quran where the Prophet will say on the day of accountability, Oh my Lord, my people have abandoned this Quran. So yeah. there has been a significant abandonment of revelation of the Quran in favor of the Hadith or the tradition, you see. Mm-hmm. And they are even treated almost uh, as equals. You mentioned Brother Hamza Yusuf earlier, and I remember him saying in two separate videos. In one video, he claims that the Mutawatir Hadiths are equal. He uses the word equal to the Quran. I said, my well, God, yeah, brother, where did you get that? How that's can you say that? The, Mm-hmm. How can you say the words of a human beings are equal to the words of God? Doesn't mm-hmm. it, aren't you coming close to a kind of polytheism, literal polytheism, when you make the yeah. uh, human beings' words equal to the words of God? In a second video that a friend of mine alerted me to, he went even further. He said there are as many as 500 hadiths that are equal to the Quran. I said, my God, this this chap lost it. Actually, I met yeah. him, you know, him to our institute. Mm-hmm. Two hands and mm-hmm. we even exchanged a few words across the table but there were a lot of people so we didn't have a time to <laughs> talk a whole lot but anyway so yeah this is a huge problem confusion between hadith and revel the quran and in fact we have this goes right back we have a hadith on the website of ibn baz this hadith is well known and he he mm-hmm. quotes it there on his website as follows he claims that the prophet muhammad peace be on him allegedly said i quote to the best of my ability, I was given two things, the Quran and something equal to it. The word equal oh. is you. And then in brackets, he put Hadith, end of quote. So you can find this on the website of Ibn Baz, the chief cleric of Saudi Arabia. He's telling oh, us that. Oh dear, yeah. So one of my first questions was, how could the Prophet uh, say that he was given the Hadith when the Hadiths were not compiled until 200 years after his demise? That, that's one thing. <laughs> another, another thing is, <laughs> so you see, the, the, the lack of respect for logic, of, for reason, mm-hmm, is yeah. not evident in the way these, some of these uh, statements are made. Not only that, since I'm on that subject, you will find other statements on his website where he says that uh, we, the Muslim Ummah, have to revere the Sunnah of the Prophet. He uses the yeah. word revere. Now, revere mm-hmm. also means worship. Is yes. he asking us to worship the Sunnah? Mm-hmm. Doesn't Allah tell us to worship him and nothing but him? Yet here, yes. even Baz is asking us to worship something else. Yes. I mean, I'm shocked. And this is the chief cleric of, uh, you know, is this the best uh, uh, person they can come up with over there? Mm-hmm. I mean, he has a lot, you have a lot of, mm-hmm. and doesn't stop there. It gets worse. Uh, in mm-hmm. a couple of other uh, lines, he says that the great uh, uh, Sahaba used to glorify the Sunnah. He uses the word glorify, my God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Doesn't Allah say in the Quran that we should glorify him? But here, even Baz mm-hmm. is telling us we should glorify something else, the Sunnah, mm-hmm. my goodness. Yes. And then in another mm-hmm. line, he adds that we, uh, the even the great imams used to glorify the sunnah. My God, mm-hmm. again. Mm-hmm. 
So this is complete misguidance, and it shows you the the, the shift from the Quran to the Sunnah or the Quran, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. the Sunnah or the Hadith that have taken place in uh, traditional Islam. Now, what what gets me is that you know the Saudis are known as Wahhabis, right? That they are all yes, of course. Tawhid, mm -hmm. but the way he, this mm -hmm. fellow he sounds, he doesn't sound like a Wahhabi at all. You know, mm -hmm. a, Wahhabi, a true Wahhabi would never say what he said just now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I have read Muhammad Abdul Wahab's book on Tawhid, and quite frankly, I didn't find anything objectionable in it. I was told that it was his followers who twisted his teaching and committed some of the atrocities that happened. Mm -hmm. He emphasizes uh, Tawhid and uh, criticizes sheer corporatism. Mm -hmm. So, so when I realized that this eclipse took hap uh, the, the, uh, transpired, I then what happen afterwards is that I began to work out the, the go bo in both directions forward and backwards forward to the effects and consequences of this event and backwards to find out the causes of what caused this event and mm. in the, the next stage of my analysis uh, in a talk I did with Edith Buxel in one of his meetings I narrowed it down to I worked it out to four stages but then okay, uh, yes. following that I'm interested I, in these four stages I think it's very um, a, a very sophisticated but yet simple um, description of what actually happened in a, a philosophical um, frame uh, within yeah. the fra a philosophical framework but it, it allows you to analyze step by step by step what happened and how we came to appreciate this catechism yeah yeah very briefly the four stages are and, and all the stages have to do with the relationship of the uh, reason revelation mm -hmm. tradition and the ulama yes. so the first stage was the elevation of tradition above reason mm -hmm. or what you can think of it as the repression of reason and this was this was done in several ways this became separate stages in the later analysis but one way in which reason was repressed was by associating its use to understand the revelation with kufr I'm not sure if you came across the concept al fikr kufr. This mm -hmm. is a notion that the very act of thinking could make you, uh, be, uh, could turn you into a kafir or an unbeliever. Yes, yes. I was impressed when you brought that in into the lecture. I, that really interested me. Yeah. And so there's even a couple of hadiths uh, which are quoted to emphasize that uh, so-called reason-based tafsir is considered to be kufr according to the Prophet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can find a reference to this hadith in a, a paper by Addis Duderija. The paper is called Neosalafism, the case of Abu Amin Abilal Phillips, and the paper is available on academia. Mm -hmm. These two these two hadiths are also cited in a book on the Quran by written by Said Abdullah, Abdullah Said, sorry. Mm -hmm. So so in other words, th there was a kind of a slender of reason that took place, uh, yes. a belittling of reason, and uh, the ulama uh, uh, informed us that we have to subordinate reason to tradition, that we have to uh, follow even the weakest hadith, even when it goes against the dictates of reason, right? So mm -hmm. uh, they're asking us to become unreasonable. So yes. to speak. So, uh, yes. in, the, in Arabic language, uh, uh, lexicon is called uh, akal is under nakal. In other words, the mm -hmm. intellect is under the tradition. This, to me, was a catastrophic uh, development, and the, all yeah. the problems began with this because this mm -hmm. had a number of consequences. So, um, I mean, uh, so that was the first, uh, you know, uh, aberration or anomaly mm -hmm. in uh, methodology of exegesis uh, in yes. traditional. The subordination of reason to tradition, which, by the way, is ironic because reason was used in the first place to authenticate different kind of traditions, right? So mm -hmm. if reason is good enough to authenticate traditions and determine whether this one is Hassan Daif or, uh, you know, fabricated, why suddenly are they willing to throw reason or rationality under the bus, so to speak? Mm -hmm. So anyway. The, the next stage, the uh, next aberration uh, was the ele further elevation of tradition of the Hadith, uh, this time to a level of equality with the Quran, with, uh, with, uh, with revelation. And mm -hmm. this uh, is, uh, was uh, given expression in the uh, assertion that Hadith or the Sunnah are also revelation, you see, revelation. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so uh, this uh, gave rise to the concept of Wahi Ain, or the dual revelation. By the way, Aisha mm -hmm. Musa had a paper on dual revelation in academia. Mm -hmm. And this equality, you see, uh, of the, uh, the, that hadith I mentioned earlier, where the Prophet allegedly said that I was given uh, the Quran and something equal to it, that uh, is a confirmation of this second uh, stage, you know. Uh, the, the equality, making the Bukhari equal to the Quran. But mm -hmm. it it didn't stop there. There was a third, uh, you know, ab aberration, and once again, it resulted from the further elevation of tradition. This time, above revelation, above the Quran. Mm -hmm. So the ulama mm -hmm. were not happy with just making uh, Bukhari and uh, company. And uh, I'm using the word Sunnah now in Shafi sense. He made the two of them uh, to be equal, but of course they are different because the real Sunnah of the Prophet was to follow, follow the Quran. In fact, we could say he was the first Quranist, but the yeah. Ahlul Sunnah, uh, Ahlul Sunnah have a very uh, great misunderstanding here. They think that the Sunnah of the Prophet is uh, to, to follow Bukhari. But did the Prophet follow Bukhari? Of course not. Did he follow his own Sunnah? Of course not. He followed what he was asked to follow. And he was asked to follow the Quran, what was revealed to him. So yeah. even the meaning of the word Sunnah has been grossly distorted. Even al Shafi mm. says that the word Hikmah in the Quran means the Sunnah of the Prophet. That is also very problematic because the word Hikmah means wisdom. It does not mean sunnah. This yeah. is really tam tampering with the meaning of the, the Arabic language and we are sometimes reminded by traditional yeah. Muslims that we cannot talk about this because our knowledge of Arabic is not good enough. But what about here when Al Shafi is rendering <laughs> the word hikmah as a sunnah? He, he might perhaps yeah. have benefited from brushing up on his Arabic too. You see? Yes, of course. So, so why did he do that? I think he did it because he couldn't find any verse in our Quran to support uh, his idea that we should follow the Sunnah or the Hadith. So he resorted mm -hmm. to the shenanigan, I basically, I would say, and tried yeah. to try to distort the meaning of this very important Arabic word. But to come back to the, the third point, the third aberration was the elevation of tradition of the Hadith, or Sunnah in Shafi says, above the Quran. And this took place in three ways. These also become separate stages in my later analysis. The first stage was to declare that the Sunnah judges the Quran. A Sunnah Qadi Allah Quran. And in fact, I heard this in my first year in the university in 2002, and I was shocked. One of my colleagues said it. So I was thinking, mm -hmm. should I say something or not? It made me feel very uncomfortable because I mm -hmm. said to myself, how can the Sunnah, the words of human beings, judge the words of God? I was really mm -hmm. puzzled. But, you know, maybe it was, um, there was another voice in my brain telling me, oh, come on, uh, you know, Abdul Karim, you're the new kid on the block, you know, you're a convert. These guys have been in Islam for so many years. What do you know? And besides, you might, yeah. might not, you might not have heard yeah. him correctly, you know, so this other voice kind of, I, I didn't say anything. I don't know whether I should be ashamed of that or not, but I, I kept quiet. But uh, I, yeah. as, time, mm -hmm. as time went by, I realized that I wasn't alone in thinking this. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a book by Taha Jabir Alwani called, uh, he was uh, chief of the Triple Eight Institute, uh, Iraqi scholar, Al Azhar scholar, PhD, known as a neo traditionalist, but also expressed very serious uh, reservations about this eclipse, although he doesn't use that word. But he, he does question this, this idea that Sunnah Qadi Allah Quran, the Sunnah judges the Quran. Uh, the book is called uh, Reviving the Balance. It was published by Triple Eight in 2017, shortly before uh, before he passed away. So this is uh, one way in which the Hadiths were elevated above the Quran. The, Sunnah. And the mm -hmm. second way was when it was alleged, uh, and once again, you can find confirmation of this in, uh, say, uh, Alwani's book, but you can find confirmation of this also in yet another book, which I would even uh, rec I would recommend even before Alwani's book, and that is the book by Muhammad Shahroor. I'm not sure whether you have come across his book called mm -hmm. Quran, Morality and Critical Reason, published in 2009 uh, in Damascus, Syria. It was a bestseller, but it really roused the traditional scholars to, uh, to attempt to rebut him. And there were, I think, about 22 rebuttals written of that book. And uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I would say that's my, uh, that is the best critique of traditional Islam that I have come across uh, so far. Mm -hmm. so, and by the mm -hmm. way, the, the available in English translation is the is only it? Oh, very good. Yeah, it's yeah. the only book that has been translated into English so far. It's available in PDF format, uh, free, uh, and it's called, once again, uh, Quran, uh, Morality and Critical Reason by Muhammad Shahroor. Excellent book. Uh, so anyway, uh, so... 
that was the the the, for, the third way in which the Sunnah was elevated above the Quran was when it was alleged that the Sunnah can uh, not only abrogate the Quran. And by the way, the traditional ulama asserted that even a solitary hadith can abrogate a Quranic verse. I was totally oh my sure. God. Exactly. And by the way, brother, this was not a minority opinion. This was the opinion oh of the majority. And mm -hmm. what they did further, they said that anyone who does not understand the abrogate doctrine of abrogation is not uh, competent to comment on the Quran. Secondly, yes. they also declared that anyone who disagrees with them has left Islam and therefore yes. has, to be, has to be killed because there's a hadith. Oh which yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, okay. so, so my question was, is this how the traditional scholars, uh, you know, arrived at their so-called ijma, the consensus of the community, by threatening to kill any people that don't agree with their misinterpretations of the Quran? I was shocked, really. Well, this constitutes politically institutionalized evil, as I see it. Absolutely. Um, there, there's no other way to explain that. I, I, I hope that phrase rings clear, because that's what it is. And uh, Professor Lobachevsky, who you're probably aware of, have, has written a book on political ponerology. And so this is what happened to the Eastern Bloc in Europe under communism. And uh, it appears that the same thing, the same positioning of the political elite that has justified their authority, if you will, has happened in Islam. And it is a traditional position. Now, let me rephrase that. It's not a position that is traditionally correct or righteous, but it has become part of the rock, if you will, or foundation of the traditionalist authority. Now, not everyone will agree with it, but if you institute a system of thinking that's going to allow you to kill someone who merely disagrees with you. Oh my God, this is evil. This is not that, righteousness. That's Keep right. Uh, it's evil. And in fact, it happened already to Rashad Khalifa, who was killed, mm -hmm. because was declared an apostate by 38 uh, wayward uh, ulama, mm -hmm. and who was killed within a year. And uh, there was another Quran centric person in Bangladesh who disappeared mm -hmm. without a there was uh, Ahmad Subhi from Egypt had to escape uh, Egypt because mm -hmm. there were some people mm -hmm. after him as well. And I think they harassed mm -hmm. some of the family. Fazlur Rahman also had to escape from Pakistan because the tradition Fazlur is Rahman is the one who woke me up to the political war of the Hadith corpus. Yeah, you see? exactly. He, he, you know, and I when I read that, I wanted to discuss it with my, my fellows at... Um, uh, Istak when I was there, and no one wanted to discuss this. N they yeah. never wanted to talk about the Hadith wars, if you will. It was a yeah. taboo subject. So yeah. I, and I so I really admire Fazlur Rahman. Yes, yeah, thank and, you. And by the way, uh, Muhammad Shahrur has an excellent explanation of this in chapter mm -hmm. six his book, the, the book I mentioned, it's about politics yes. and how this hadith, killing the apostates, was used basically to repress political opposition and to enforce yes. Yes. Uh, uniformity, you know, on the people. And he, mm -hmm. he also provides uh, other interesting insights. Yes. So, so then the last, you know, aberration uh, took place or took uh, place in the form of the elevation of something else, uh, mm -hmm. I'm something else, above both reason and revelation. And now what, and even tradition, now what was this something else? That is was this elevated? the fourth step now? Is... Yeah, fourth, fourth yes, step, the, the okay, last one go. of the four big mm -hmm. steps. Now. Yes. So this is a bit condensed, but the detailed explanation mm -hmm. of what you can find in uh, my book called uh, Is Islam mm -hmm. a Religion or Peace? There I have have all together 12 steps. <laughs> he did it oh, 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 okay. yeah. From 40 to 26, and I have a book also called uh, the, uh, the Six Waves That Transformed the Religion of Peace into Islamism or Polonism. Mm -hmm. So I kept working on it. I realized that I was conflating some some events. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought separate them for analytical purposes. And so yes. I ended up 12 altogether. I hope I don't have to add any more. I don't want to make it too <laughs> complicated. <laughs> you know, people say you can have something like paralysis from too much analysis. I see different yes, things. yes, and this is possible. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, the last step was that something else was elevated this time above both reason, revelation, and even tradition. And what was this something else? Well, it was the ulama themselves. 
became uh, the, the priesthood. Yeah. Exactly, the highest authority, as uh, that fellow from Georgetown University, uh, jo uh, John Esposito, says. The, yeah. the you see the scholar, scholars, they said we interpret uh, the hadith. The hadith interpreted the Quran. So in other words, the ijma of the ulama overrules everything. Yes. Yeah. Allah mm -hmm. ends up in third place, so to speak, after Sunnah and, and Ulama. And, uh, <laughs> and an expression of this attitude can be found in a statement mm -hmm. by uh, one of the Imams, Imam Abu Hassan al karhi and I'm quoting mm -hmm. here Alwani's book, that's where the quote may be found. He declared mm -hmm. that if anything that we say, uh, he says he was a Hanafite scholar, he, uh, that, uh, and this Karhi said that if anyone finds anything in what we say that contradicts the Quran, or uh, then one of the two should be considered abrogated. And guess mm -hmm. which one should be considered abrogated according to them? <laughs> oh, God, oh the word, yeah, oh. the words of Allah. Should, should, so now the ulama can abrogate, overrule, yes. can, cancel the words of their own creator. Now, yes. how, what's the right word? Please help me out. How arrogant, how ignorant, which is greater arrogance. than Well, ignorance serves arrogance and arrogance serves evil. So you have a systematic institutionalization of uh, of evil that has been governing the uh, uh, Ummah for the last thousand years at least. So let me let us stop there now, brother, because I don't want to exhaust our listeners and see if we can't take this up again, uh, maybe next week. If you can meet the same time every week, that would be wonderful. If this is uh, a good time, a good hour for you, we've yep. been inter uninterrupted. I think it's wonderful, and I think our our listeners will benefit uh, from such a discussion and from the knowledge that Allah has placed in you with respect to people, places, ideas, things, and all that sort of thing. Uh, I would like to review these four steps again as we go on, uh, inshallah, and place them historically in perspective. If yeah. we can do that, because yeah. I think our benefit, our listeners will benefit from that, because the historicity of Islam has been distorted by the preoccupation with this classical, you know, grand age, golden age, and it wasn't that golden, and it was certainly grand, but it certainly wasn't golden in terms of true appreciation of uh, revelation. Um, so. Let me just say that I truly appreciate what you've brought to us and uh, may it please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to continue um, maybe next week, Tuesday evening, the same time, your time, uh, we'll meet again and uh, I will make sure that these, um, these um, uh, recordings are uh, properly um, uh, positioned and edited and and then uh, I'll, I'll share them with you. I will post them on whatever sites I have available and you post them wherever you've got available uh, for the benefit of our listeners and those students who are seeking the truth and are seeking to use their brains properly. Yeah. They're, seeking, they're seeking validation. And yes. besides seeking validation, they are seeking relevance. Yes, How absolutely. do we make Islam relevant? Well, you're not going to make Islam relevant if you hold on to the traditionalist position because the traditionalist position is preventing that relevance. It's preventing the yeah. practical application of revelation. That's what yeah. it's doing in preservation of this priesthood. So let's go back again uh, systematically, dear yeah. brother. And trace this history of these four steps that you've outlined, and without getting too um, involved with all these 12 steps, you can certainly bring them in the middle <laughs> as we go along. But um, it, Well, you know, listen, brother, in a certain sense, this is kind of, we can call this uh, Muslim Anonymous, okay? We want to talk about 12 steps, okay? Let's, let's just do it. This is Muslim Anonymous. What we're doing is we're we're, 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 we're revising, helping people to revise their perspective, to, to get a correct perspective, an in-depth view of what has happened and why it is that Muslims have lost their dominion and, in subject, and become subject to incoherencies. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I hope and pray that Allah will allow us to sure. perform 
the actions that are in conformity with adab. One of my greatest um, um, uh, admiration, my greatest admiration extends to Professor Alatas because his work has um, really defined the many, many problems confronted by the Ummah. And um, this adab, the definition of things, people and places and concepts and putting them in proper divine order is what has been missing. Yeah. yeah. It has been missing and yet the ulama claims to have done it. And in fact, they haven't. They haven't. They have justified their own position of power and authority uh, over Muslims who are trying to seek this relevance that we're talking about. So, brother, until next week, may God uh, keep you in his refuge. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And thanks for having me on, brother. You're welcome.